I'm glad you're here. Last week when the video surfaced of Ahmaud Arbery's tragic death, so many people were shocked and grieving. So in this week's episode, Jai and I hold the space for each other to discuss our thoughts and feelings about Ahmad and race relations in general. So we invite you to hold the space with us. And this episode is in honor of Ahmad Arbery. Hello, and welcome to the Deepening Place podcast. I'm here today with Jai. Hello, Jai. Hey, Angela. How's it going? It's going, it's going well. How's it going for you? Um, pretty good. I'm here in New Orleans right now. I drove in yesterday to visit my mom oh, and yeah? sister. Yeah, so I just got in sometime last night. I'm pretty rested, feel good. It's always oh. nice to be home. Well, thank you for doing this. Oh, of vacation. course. I'm always happy. Yeah. Last week when we finished the podcast, you know, we talked about kind of what direction we wanted to go in. And we've always said we wanted to talk about race, but we just haven't really gotten there yet. Yep. And last week we said we thought it was time. And little did we know what was going to happen this week. You know, even in the midst of the pandemic that's happening, it really does highlight how much of an, an issue this is in this country, if nothing else, in the perspective of people and like lived experience, because this is dominating my news feed in every dimension imaginable. I don't know. It's been very hard for me personally to like any sort of thoughts about it. I've been doing a lot of just listening and reading. That's where I'm so at with it. We're talking about Ahmad Arbery. And yes. You said that the the pandemic itself had brought some things to light and now this just intensifies it? Uh no, more like I guess the normal like circles I'm in on social media or whatever my news outlets are, this has overshadowed COVID nineteen. Got it. Okay. I understand. Mm-hmm. I just have a lot of questions for, I guess, slightly older white people is where I'm at now. And how well, this is you got one on the line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. And my questions are really just kind of overarching. Like, what is what was your um, how did you feel when you saw this? I guess that's my first one. How do you feel when you see something like this still happening? Yeah. I mean, God. It's, I don't know if there's even a word that describes how I feel when I see that. I have three sons. And as a mother, naturally, I'm looking at it that way. If that happened to one of my kids, I can't imagine what his mother's feeling right now. There's just no consolation at all. It's just tragic. Mm. Then that's a connecting point for, I, I think, across people. I took a, a, there's a course called Beyond Diversity. In that course, there's some historical points and some kind of lived experience points. And one of them is reality of being a mother of a Black child, particularly a Black boy, and yeah. being worried about things like this happening. And I wanted to ask that question because in that group, I made a, a, a friend who's another older white woman. And that was our connection point. She heard this and she started crying in the session. And she was saying, I had never thought of like my child leaving the house and them being murdered or like brutalized because of their race. And we just got into a long conversation about like, I know how my mom feels and has felt and what it was like for me, you know, with that lived experience. It is, it is calming and settling to hear other people, like people that aren't black share a point of like, I would be really concerned or fearful, like you said, and that there's no, um, I'm not sure what, I forgot what word you just used. There's no consolation. Yeah. There's no consolation in it. Kind of leads to the next point of like, where in a very real way, what happens from, from here? This is probably from my eyes, this has to be the most blatant. We killed this man because he is black. Yeah. 
very openly blatant. And it's one of the first times I've seen in some social media circles or even people I know who are conservative and I know will ride with the Confederate flag on a very like pretty anti everything you could think of Muslim, Mexican, black, even yeah. those conversations I've been seeing happening like on Facebook posts. You in know, relation to this? In relation to Ahmaud Arbery's death. You know, I have a friend, he's a white guy about the same age, and he made a post being an ally or whatever. He's part, you know, he's he's American too. So part of his community, you know, he made a post and shared shared his experience. He went running with his kids and said, I'm white and, you know, I've never had that fear. And he had cousins, you know, and relatives posting on there um, saying, Ben, we love you. And I know we've never seen eye to eye on racial issues and stuff, but um, I can understand your point. This is the first time I'm really seeing it. And for me, for my eyes, I've never seen I've never seen white people in community on Facebook across like left, right, Republican, Democrat, racist or even non-racist, whatever the case, say, wow, I kind of finally get the point now um, just because yeah. of how blatantly messed up it was. I mean, it reminds you of like a, an old textbook lynching from way back. I watched the video. It's incredibly barbaric, incredibly barbaric. So my questions have really been like, what is what do other people see, you know? The community I live in has seen this and lived with this reality for a long time. And I think the other, the last thing that came up for me is last episode, you and I were talking about living with trauma. You know, I was explaining something from childhood and saying how I went home every weekend. And you said, Jai, you were living with trauma. There's a comment that's made about Ahmaud Arbery's death that resonated with me. And, you know, it's a lot of Black folks sharing. You know, I'm, when I go out in public, you know, I'm, I'm wary of this. I'm aware of this. I'm, you know, I have to be. I talked to a security guard and it wasn't until I saw someone else post that. And I was like, oh my goodness, not everyone has to do that in this country. And it's kind of like, I don't know if that's a lived trauma. I don't know what that is, but there's a whole perspective on life that I'm just realizing, just real, I mean, a few days ago, just realizing a lot of people don't walk around with, because I definitely go in the store. The first person I look for is a police officer or the security guard to make sure to see me and that they think I'm friendly. It's been like that since I was a kid. Like that's been trained, yeah. that's been instilled. I didn't realize people didn't think like that. Like when you go into a store, you're trying to make contact and let whoever's in charge of security, they, you want them to know you're okay. You're not somebody they need to be watching. Sort of like that. It's at least that. And honestly, it's not too cognitive. There's not too much of, you know, an explanation. It's just, I think mm -hmm. for me, it's, um, I want to at least just look you in the eye because it's very normal to get followed in certain stores and um, depending on the area, it's very normal to get followed. But the more you kind of greet someone in their eyes, the less likely they are to follow you. Mm -hmm. I think it's just from a safety standpoint, it's never really trying to connect too much. Or if from the other side, try to make them feel safe and at least like, you know, greet them or acknowledge them. But it's always mm -hmm. safety one way or another. Yeah, that is something that's not normal for me. and probably not normal for white people. Do you remember where this happened without me going on the internet? It was Brunswick, Georgia. Georgia. Um, is that far from where you grew up? Yeah, Brunswick is a little more south, and it's on the coast-ish area. And I grew up kind of in central Georgia. That makes it a little more interesting for me, too, as far as perspective, I think. I was a Southern girl raised in Georgia. Yeah. Did you have any other questions? I do. It's hard to frame for a singular person, but I would guess, and I'm not trying to ask just you. My main question was really what the experience is like, what the reaction was. I guess it's, First, do you have, I guess, relatives or people close to you that are like, you know what, those two men that did the murdering or or did the killing aren't murderers, you know? Like, do you have people in your circle that support them or see this as justified somehow? I think because I am from Georgia, I have two brothers, five nephews, loads of male acquaintances my father still living. I can't imagine anyone like that I'm close to or that I know personally that wouldn't be horrified by this. There are different types of people in the world. There are 
what we used to call rednecks, which not this is, gets complicated because not all rednecks are racist. And there are some of the most racist people that you would never imagine are racist. They play the game and they talk a good talk. When I was younger, I mean, I went to a public high school that was about 50% black and white. And, you know, there were different types of people. And growing up there, I mean, I understood that. I understood that there were people that were kind of prejudiced because maybe that's the way they'd been raised, but they still had black friends. And then there were people that were truly more racist that were against black people. And, you know, I think every that was kind of a common knowledge. People knew that. That's something that we don't talk about. We lump everybody together. And one thing that I've noticed is all the shame, all the white people demanding how much shame that we should, we should feel over this. I don't know how you feel about that. Putting shame on everyone who identifies as white. Yeah. That's silly. That won't help anything. I say that's silly because that doesn't help anything. Well, I, I understand it. I think the notion is silly, not someone's thought. Because I understand why they think that, or why you would even want to feel shame. I understand that. There has to be some acknowledgement of what really happened and is still happening. Because that past is not really a past. That's what a mod arbor really means to me. There's no past. It's not like something that used to happen and actually never stopped happening. And quite frankly, we probably see more of it now just because of social media and the news. Who knows how often it actually does happen and just doesn't just doesn't get found out. This stuff stuff like this definitely happened when I was in college and at LSU, you know, with cops like, oh man, with all sorts of stuff, like all sorts of illegal and brutal, forget illegal, just brutal stuff happening from from white people to black people. So I think that's step one for me. That's why I'm not too big on the shame um, aspect because it's still living. This is a living problem. It's still here today. It's still here today. And it has been from the root. From the very first day of this country or even people settling land here, it never went away and it's still, it's not our past. It is our present. Another of my initial reactions was to people kind of asking, you know, about how, how does this keep happening or our past is our past, or we got to learn from our past. It's it's just that point of it's not a past. It's the problem is we don't recognize it as a present in the right way. I love your point about rednecks are not all. You know, it's just a title. It's 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 a thing, and I'm laughing. I'm literally laughing out loud because I mentioned a guy here in New Orleans last time, who he's a conservative guy. He openly supports Donald Trump, but if there's a textbook picture of what a black ally looks like it's this guy and he lives here and he would definitely if not him the rest of his family identified as, as rednecks so the picture gets really it's just very confusing i actually feel more confused as i try to think about anything around it why is this still happening i guess my question for you is you you have a few decades on me in a different perspective you're from georgia why are communities still existing like that where people you know you know, why is that happening in Georgia? What is the historical context there? I think what we do, our mind is designed to operate this way. So we put everyone that's the same together. In the white community, we can say about each other, there's redneck, elitist, yuppie. We're talking about different types of people. And our mind does that. It makes us feel comfortable because we feel like we're narrowing it down. We don't have to think about everything we could put them in different categories. It's part of our defense system that the mind does. I notice in times like this, we put we want to put everybody together from some of the liberal white groups. It's everybody that supports Trump is a white supremacist racist. And just like I said before, all those people that I mentioned from Georgia, they're probably... Trump supporters. I mean, I haven't interviewed every one of them, but I would say I didn't know that many Democrats growing up. I would imagine that a lot of people are conservative and probably voted for Trump. But that doesn't mean they're racist. Things we've talked about before, like the, our greatest sin is our refusal to see. And the greatest consequence is a lack of unity. 
What I think people need to see here is that Georgia is diverse and there are a lot of different types of people there. And this is a horror show for, I would guess, a majority of people that live there. I don't know if they were an anomaly in their neighborhood or if they were an anomaly in their town. But I know of all the people that I know and love in Georgia, I've, I don't know people that would do that. I don't know anyone who would be okay with that. When I go to Georgia, it's a melting pot. People aren't allowing themselves to see Atlanta when they, when they do that. They're not allowing themselves to see the upper middle class to wealthy black neighborhoods surrounding Atlanta. They don't get the whole picture. Just like everything, it's complicated and diverse, and it goes so deep into our history, but us not allowing ourselves to see each other is part of the problem. Yeah. Does that I like make sense? what you said there. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. I think for me, what this is me personally, what would make me not so much feel better, but feel like we're taking a step in the right direction is we need some public acknowledgement. We need to see the other side as well. And this is definitely sketchy territory, but see the other side. I'm, I'm very curious about why are so many people, because we don't hate as children, right? Why are so many people programmed to hate? And how is that still carried out? Like, why were those two men so terrified of this black guy? Why is that fear there? How is it still there? That's what I'm really curious about. And acknowledging it to the point of you hate me or you don't like me, okay, but murder is a line no, no one's going to cross. I don't care if your opinion is that all Black people should be exported back to wherever you think. But the point where you start infringing upon, A, rights, you shouldn't even come to rights, but you can murder me over it, and that's socially acceptable in the circles you're in, that's a line that can't be crossed. I would like to acknowledge it and try to understand why that exists, why that hatred is so deep but with some clear boundary of within that community saying, this is not cool. This is not okay. This is way murder is not okay. There's no, no purging of people needs to happen here. It, I, I'm not even yeah. sure what I'm saying there. Yeah. There's a convergence of a lot of issues here. And when you say, why is there that much hate? I don't know if they hated him? Had they seen him around the neighborhood? Did Do they hate all Black people and their fantasy was to kill a Black person one day? Who knows? But I think it's more than just racism. We're also getting into toxic masculinity. So mm. it might not have even been that much of... Thank you. It was a convergence, okay? It was yes. at least a convergence. I'm Wyatt Earp, and I'm going to get my gun, and I'm going to go out there and <laughs> take care of the neighborhood. It was awful and grisly, and that's not how we do it here in this country. And <sighs> I have brothers, nephews, and sons, and I am a big proponent of traditional masculinity. But every single person on the planet has been wounded by immature masculinity. Every boy, every girl, every person. And when you put a little racism with immature masculinity or toxic masculinity, it can lead you to ugly places that we have all seen. You know, thank you for framing that like that. It is that easy to forget about a bias. I am a guy and I, I completely forget that. And it... It's true. Everything you just said, I really don't want to add on that anymore. <laughs> Angela, that really is it. So there's a there is definitely an underlying current of toxic masculinity. I think that's where my my thoughts about the murder and stuff come from. Hmm. What happens in a situation like this is it terrifies people so much that they run and cling to their group. And so the left runs over to the left further, and the right runs over to the right further. And that's the thing that has to stop happening. It's the great mother versus the great father. I'm way 
too emotional on one side and feelings and shame and all of that. And on the other side, I'm refusing to see in a different way. If I acknowledge it, then it's going to, it threatens my way of being and it threatens my way of life. So it's better for me not to see it. So I'm not going to allow myself to see the horrific nature of what happened. I'm going to go, oh my God, he carried a loaded gun into a high school when he was, he was a youngster or he was, he, he was a shoplifter. So obviously he deserved to die in cold blood in the light of day in a neighborhood just running along. He obviously, yeah, that was probably okay because he had a record. We have to dig up and, you know, do that character assassination. Yeah. What do you think that puts us as an American community at large today? I guess my my thoughts, not even so much questions, are like implications of this, because it is so it is intersectional, like you said. I almost yeah. think we, you could double down on the toxic toxic masculinity point because there's a pretty distinct visual in my head that I couldn't draw personally, but of how that intersects with racism here. I cannot think of a story of a woman, or at least many women doing this. It's almost always a man. Or if it is a woman, it's been like the police officer did that, right? Like murdered that guy, walked into the wrong apartment, and police mm -hmm. is a pretty traditional male role. That, I think, I don't know, for me, I know you said that's a, a hot point, but I think that's the one to make. I have a lot more like questions or thoughts, or I just want to hear more about that. And I think I would, I'm hoping the implication is that that can come out at some point, you know, that I think media and the general discussions amongst people without media are all in long race without the talk of what you just said about that toxic masculinity being involved. Maybe it wouldn't have to keep coming to this, to physical blows or whatever it is, you know, if that if that could be addressed, because that is not particular to race. Not at all. Right. We're not telling each other the truth. We don't allow each other to sit together and see each other. And so it causes division. And we're never going to be okay if we don't figure that out. We can believe the world is a horrible place and in our personal lives, feel fairly safe and even have a wide array of acquaintances and friends. But we keep believing the narrative that we've been fed, you know? Yeah. It's not to say that some people really, really have it in their face every day. I don't, I don't not believe that. I believe that it's, that's probably true for some people. But I do believe that in the United States of America, in a lot of communities, on most days, people are working together, living together, loving each other, and getting along. We need to realize that that's also true. It's not that this is not true, but that's also true. It's a powerful point that's pretty hard to get out there, though, you know. Yeah, because of the fear. That's the thing. People... Yeah run to their extremes in times of fear. And if this doesn't make you afraid, then it's terrifying. Huh. You know, I'm here, I'm, I'm in New Orleans right now. My mom got diagnosed with coronavirus, like, oh, probably two months ago at this point, right? Yeah. Long, she's long done with it. Like, it's, she's more than fine. Long done with it. My sister lives with, they live together. My sister's been exposed months ago. And you would think, you know, my mom has it now. Like any virus, she's got the antibody. She's good. She's She's been given the clear. My mom has bottles of Lysol all over this house. <laughs> she wipes down everything 10 times a day. She wears a, she doesn't leave the house and she wears a face mask inside. She has completely doubled oh. down on some perceived level of fear. And I'm like, your worst fear was should have been getting it because you're older, but you had it and it's over. And even then, nope. I mean, she's full blown. I don't know. The amount of toilet paper here is, is enough to build a house like 
I mean, fully, fully doubled down on it. And I hear your point. The same thing for me is the same thing with like these, with the murders of, of black men here or murders of black people here. They do completely overshadow progress, more or less. And it's hard even saying it out loud. To everyone listening, I am a black man from a former murder capital of the U.S. in in New Orleans, Louisiana. And even then, it's still hard to say. What's hard to say? it's, it's, It's hard to say that incidents like these are not happening at the rate that they used to. The KKK is not blundering through towns. Black Tulsa is not happening again. There's a great documentary about Black Tulsa, but those things aren't happening at that murderous scale as they once were. It has toned down, but it's very hard to say because once, yeah. I mean, it is it's the death of someone, right? Ahmaud Arbery deserves some, his legacy yeah. to be shared. And at the same time, we need examples of where that isn't happening to be talked about. We need, we do need that. We need examples of where that isn't openly happening. I hear your point there. And it, we do have yeah. to heal. I think that's everyone's point. We got to get past this, right? No matter what you are, we got to get past this. And for me, you know, I keep saying I had, or I started out saying I had questions for white people. My questions are probably actually just for the two guys who, who killed him, killed him out, Aubrey. I don't, I'm not a silencer. I do want to hear from them. What was happening, man? Like what, what is that? What is that? And I'm, I'm not a formal psychologist or counselor, but even if it's just for, we start collecting the data or the stories or something from, from, from the people, mostly men that keep doing this, where this keeps happening. What's the common draw line in this phenomenon? Why is murder okay to you? So that's who I'd like to hear from more often. I don't know. That's what my thoughts are. And they're still very like, my thoughts are still very, very, very scrambled. And thank you for having space to talk about this. Like, oh man, I have so many black friends and people in spaces that just say like, I don't talk about this at work. I don't talk about it around white people because I'm still terrified to talk about it around white people. Yeah. That is something really interesting. The, the movement that one of the narratives there is that I shouldn't have to explain it to you. If you hear that as a white person, you're afraid to ask. You don't know who it's afraid. It's okay to ask like, Jai, tell me what this means to you. This must be horrible for you. Surely it brings something up. And then for you to sit down and just wrestle with these feelings and be vulnerable and tell me what your emotions surrounding it is, it helps me to to understand that. I'm not a man. I'm not a black man. I'm not a black person. So for us to say that we we shouldn't explain, I think that's going in the wrong direction. And I'm not saying every person that I encounter has the obligation to to talk to me. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying if you have friends, if you have family, I mean, there are a lot of people that have mixed race families. Look them in the eye and say, I can't even imagine what this might mean to you. But if you would like to talk about it, please know that I'm available. I want to understand where you're coming from. It's the conversations that are going to get us there. There are good people in the world wanting to do good. Let's empower the people that want to do good to do good how they can do something useful to make things better for people that have it harder than they do. Mm, that I think that last point you just said, like, quote, have it harder than they do, that has been a very um, divisive line when I start talking to some white people, even people close to me. I don't know why that is, but there seems to be a refusal of acknowledging that it has been harder in this country to be black than to not be. and that. Me personally, I'm able to wade through those. I, I can wade through that water. You know, that's that's a gift from God to me. A lot of people, not just black people, cannot wade through something like that when someone else can't even begin to hear or at least get a structure of like, you know what? That sounds like it might have been a little harder. Even if I don't believe it, let me listen. It gets shut down so often there. And that's where the fear for a lot of black people speaking out to quote unquote white people, you know, we're generalizing too much with these colors, but how you have no context of it to the point where there's harder challenges. Life has been harder. Some people don't seem to take that as truth or don't have the information that they need to see that as truth. Yeah. I I think it gets back to story and seeing people as humans. Mm. And 
when you have a relationship with someone, you're interested in where their pain points are. You're interested in what their experience has taught them and what their perspective is. And that's just the definition of love. I've shared some of my pain with you, and you shared some of your pain with me. That's what's going to change the world when we can see each other and hold the space for each other's suffering. There's a whole group of people that are traumatized by our history as a nation. We need to see that. And we need to ask people how it affects them. And honestly, for some people, it doesn't affect them as much. And that's okay, too. Every black person doesn't need a white ally. It's insulting to believe that every black person needs a white ally. Thank you for saying it. Yes, it is. It's it's it is insulting. It's I don't know. That's shoot. I I work in that space and I and I get lost on what that means sometimes. Mm. If we could all put unity as our highest good and protect it as the thing that's going to lead us to life, we'd be going in the right direction. Yeah, we got to find a way to get there because we need, we do need the Ahmaud Arbery to stop. I mean, we need all murder to stop. Man, just wish peace to that, to Ahmaud Arbery's family, everybody's family involved with that. It's, it's truly tragic. It's not even comprehensible. No, it really so, isn't. It's, no. Well. I love you, Jai. Love you too, Angela. Thanks for holding this space and and keeping it up. Yeah, I appreciate you talking to me about it. I really do. Always. All right. Do you have anything else you want to say before we go? No. No. I think we just let's respect the space. So I think we talked it through as best we could today. All right. Thank you. Very welcome.